Hi, and uh, welcome to this video on lower bounds for multiplication via network coding. So I'm Casper Green Larsen. I'm an associate professor at Aarhus University at the Department of Computer Science and also a part-time full professor at Copenhagen University associated with the Bach Research Center, which stands for Basics Algorithms Research Copenhagen. Okay, so as, as mentioned, this talk is going to be about lower bounds for multiplication. Okay, so let's start out uh, with a basic question uh, that you can ask yourself. So if I gave you these two uh, questions here, would you rather multiply or rather add these eight-digit numbers together? Right, I think if most of you, even with a piece of paper and pencil, I would assume that most of you would prefer to add the two numbers rather than to multiply them. And so uh, I sat down and actually did it on here on the left side of the screen. You can see uh, my computations or calculations when I wanted to add the two numbers. I did exactly what you would normally do unless you learn in, in elementary school. You add the digits uh, from least significant towards most significant, and then you uh, keep a carry as you go along. Right, so so that, that doesn't take up too much uh, space on your piece of paper. Instead, if you wanted to multiply the two numbers, which you can see on the right-hand side, uh, what I did here was to do the standard elementary school algorithm again, which is, I guess, sometimes called long multiplication, where you take each digit of one of the numbers and multiplies it on to the whole uh, other number, right? So you can see one line on the paper below for each digit of the lowest number, the 82 million something. I multiplied that one digit through uh, the entire a top number, and then you do it for every digit in the second number, giving you one line on the piece of paper, and you put a zero uh, for each each time you move one digit out. And so once you've done that and multiplied all the numbers through, uh, you can then add the whole thing up. And then when you multiply one number through, you again start by multiplying onto the lowest digit. There might be a carry, then you multiply onto the second lowest digit, and you might get a carry, and so on. Okay, so at least in this, this example, right, it looks like there's a lot more computation that needs to be done to multiply the two numbers uh, rather than if you want to add the two numbers together. Okay, so you could ask yourself, right, is multiplication a harder problem than addition? At least it seems that way so far, right? So uh, let's say we try to analyze this from algorithm's point of view, and we say that the numbers that we want to add or multiply have n digits. Okay, then you could ask yourself, how much computation am I doing uh, when I'm carrying out these two algorithms. On the left-hand side, when we add the two numbers, as you can see, right, we're going to use a constant number of lines on the sheet of paper, uh, two lines to write the numbers, one line to write the result, and maybe a line to, to write the carries on. Okay, so a constant number of lines, independent of n, and the number of columns is going to be theta n. Right, so it's going to be uh, theta, uh, or it's going to be n uh, up to plus one. Okay, so, uh, but if you look at the, the right-hand side where we do the multiplication, you can see, right, that each line has theta n digits. Right, that's the result of multiplying one digit at a uh, taking one digit and multiplying through the entire other number. And then you're going to have a line for every digit in the second number, right? So it's going to be n lines with n digits each uh, when you do this computation. So, so basically, the first computation is going to take theta n time, so linear time in the, no in the size of the inputs, whereas the multiplication is going to take quadratic time in the size of the inputs. Okay, so uh, at least um, here, the multiplication is taking a lot longer or using a lot more paper than uh, if you wanted to just add the two numbers together. Okay, so you could ask yourself, right, is multiplication really a harder problem or is it just because we have a bad algorithm for multiplying numbers together, right? So um, this algorithm that we use for multiplication it's actually the same algorithm that has been used roughly since uh, Babylon, right? So it's a really old algorithm, thousands of years old. And uh, it hadn't been improved since then. And it led, in 1960, uh, the Russian mathematician Komogorov to conjecture that actually, if you want to multiply two n-digit numbers, then that requires n-squared operations. Okay. So uh, what Kolmogorov did was he arranged a seminar at Moscow State University where the goal was to actually prove this conjecture, right? Prove that multiplication cannot be done faster than a quadratic number of operations. Okay. Now, uh, one week later, uh, after arranging the seminar, uh, one week into the seminar, the student Karatsuba found a new algorithm 
which actually does a strongly Socratic number of operations to multiply two numbers, in particular n to the 1.585 operations roughly. Okay, so Kolmogorov then presented this algorithm at the next meeting of the seminar and then he terminated the series, right, because the conjecture was clearly false. The multiplication could be done significantly faster than Kratic time. And if you want to if skip forward to today, so actually only last year there was an improvement to multiplication uh, where Harvey and van der Hoeven gave an, an algorithm for multiplying two n bit numbers in n log n time. Actually, it's an, a Boolean circuit uh, with n log n size that can multiply two n bit numbers together. Okay, and this is actually the state of the art, and this improved over an algorithm that was almost as fast, something like n log n times four to the iterated log n uh, time. Okay, so it's a slight improvement, but uh, down to a very nice and clean running time. And this algorithm and many other algorithms uh, before it is based on the fast Fourier transform by Cooley and Tucky, uh, which has been named one of the top 10 algorithms of the 20th century, right? So, so these fast multiplication algorithms today are based on the fast Fourier transform. Okay, so that's the state of the art n log n time. So what we know now is that uh, the difficulty of multiplication lies somewhere between linear time and n log n time, but we don't know exactly where it is. Right? It lies somewhere in between. Addition is down at linear time. Multiplication is somewhere in this interval. Uh, what is the right or true complexity of multiplication? Is it as easy as addition, or is it perhaps a little bit harder or somewhere in between linear and n log n? So, of course, when we have such a question, we can also try to address it from a lower bound point of view, right? Can we just can we prove there cannot be a fast algorithm for multiplication? Can we prove that it's harder than addition? In particular, can we show that it requires n log n time or n log n size circuits to multiply two n bit numbers? Okay, so what tools could we potentially use to prove such a lower bound, right? So what are the tools that we know of for proving lower bounds on algorithms? So I guess the most classic line of work is this is the NP hardness results. So uh, if, I guess you all know the NP hardness. Uh, so here we basically the kind of lower bounds you can prove based on NP hardness is uh, statements of the form that there cannot be an algorithm running in n to the c time for any constant c uh, if we believe that p is not equal to NP. Right? So there's no polynomial time algorithm if p is not equal to NP. As you can see, this kind of lower bound cannot really distinguish linear time from n log n time. It can only distinguish polynomial time from super polynomial time. So NP hardness is not the right tool uh, to use to address this question. Now, maybe here's an area that you might not know of, but in the last, say, 10 years, this area of fine-grained complexity has really picked on. And what this area allows you to do is to prove results of, uh, kind of like this, that says that um, a concrete problem, the algorithmic problem, doesn't have an n to the 2 minus c algorithm for any constant c greater than 0 based on some widely believed conjectures like uh, one is called free sum, one is called the all pairs source path conjecture, and one is called the orthogonal vectors conjecture. There's also the strong exponential time hypothesis, right? So there's a bunch of conjectures. If you believe them, you can prove low bounds of this form, right? So basically, these are just saying that you cannot have an n to the 1.99 time algorithm for a problem. So, so here again, you can only distinguish the running time or the complexity of problems by a polynomial factor, right? A log factor is not in the scope of what this technique or this area of work uh, can help us distinguish, right? It doesn't distinguish uh, log factors, only polynomial factors. Okay, so, so again, this area, uh, all the tools we have there are not really applicable uh, for us. So finally, we could ask ourselves, uh, what about unconditional lower bound? Right? Can we prove it? So both of the two areas above uh, rely on conjectures, like conjectures that P is not equal to NP, or conjectures that free sum is hard, or all pairs shows path is hard, and so on. Can we just prove it unconditionally? Right? Can we just prove a circuit lower bound that doesn't rely on any assumptions? Now, unfortunately, the strongest known lower bound uh, that we have is just 3N. So if the input has N bit, if a problem has N bit input, the strongest, the highest circuit lower bound, if we don't make any assumptions on the depth of the circuit or so on, is just 3n. So it's just linear, right? We cannot prove an n log n lower bound or just even an n log log lower bound or anything like that. Okay, so that's the sad state of the art in unconditional lower bounds. Okay, 
So really, we don't have any well-known tools for, for distinguishing linear time from n log n time if our computational model is something like a circuit, for instance. Right? Um, you might have heard of n log n lower bounds for comparison-based sorting algorithms. Uh, but again, this is really making a lot of assumptions about how your algorithm works. If you just want to say that it, there's no Boolean circuit uh, of linear size for multiplication, you have no tools for answering such a question. Okay. So what I'm going to talk to you about in this lecture is uh, this result, low, low bounds for multiplication via network coding. And this is joint work with uh, three co-authors, Payman Afshani, Kasper Frexen, and Leo Kama, which were all at Aarhus University at the time of we, we had this result. And the, basically, the main message of this result is that multiplication is actually harder than addition. In particular, we prove that uh, any Boolean circuit for multiplication of two n-bit numbers must have size n log n. Okay, so you cannot do it uh, with linear size. And uh, this work is basically built on some ideas that were developed in an earlier paper the same year, uh, together with uh, co-authors Elias Faradi, Muhammad Taki Hadjagaya, and Elaine Shi. Right? And this, in that work, uh, we looked at lower bounds for sorting integers. And I'll get back to that towards the end of the talk, just to mention a little bit more about what this result uh, says. Okay. Uh, this result, the, the latter result here, was also featured in the uh, communications of the ACM uh, October issue in 2020 as uh, one of the two research highlights uh, in that uh, magazine. Okay. So what is network coding, right? So now network coding appears in these titles and seems, and these, this network coding is the key idea or technique underlying the lower bounds. Okay, so the lower bound we're going to prove are going to be based on a uh, central conjecture in the area of network coding. Okay, so the lower bound is still going to have the flavor of if this conjecture is true, like p is not equal to np, then we have a lower bound. Okay, and this conjecture that we're going to base the result on is called the undirected k pairs conjecture, uh, dates back to 2004 by Li and Li. Okay, so I'll, I'll get to what the conjecture says uh, in a few slides. Okay. And this conjecture had been, before our work, had been used once by Adler et al. in 2006 to prove some lower bounds on uh, circuits for computing the transpose of a matrix. But it hadn't really picked on using this conjecture for uh, for algorithms low bounds or circuit low bounds. Okay, so I guess to understand the conjecture, we need to first know what is the area of network coding? What is the questions that we study in network coding? And at a high level, network coding studies uh, communication problems in graphs. Okay, so the setup in a network coding problem is that we have a directed acyclic graph. Each of the edges has a capacity on it. So, for instance, here each edge has a capacity of two, and we have a directed acyclic graph. Okay. In network coding, we have uh, k sources and k sinks. So it looks like this. So, for instance, we have two sources at the top, source one and source two, and we have two sinks at the bottom, uh, sink two and sink one. Okay. Now, each of the sources receive an input that has a message and it has R bits in it. Okay, so for instance, source 1 receives an R bit message called A1 and source 2 receives an R bit message called A2. And the goal for them is to send the messages to the corresponding sinks. So source 2 needs to transmit the message A2 to the sink T2 and source S1 needs to send the message A1 to the sink T1. Okay, so by sending it means that this, the sinks must be able to output this message uh, once the communication is done. Okay. So it has to be sent through the network, and each node of the network, the message that the node may send, can be any function of all the incoming messages it has seen. Right? So it can do whatever it likes to do, as long as it computes it based on the messages that it has received. Right? Since it's a direct ASIC graph, you start at the top, each of the sources computes what they want to send on the outgoing edges and forwards it. And whenever a node has received all the incoming messages that it needs, it computes and sends outgoing messages along the edges. Okay. And the constraint here is that these capacity constraints on the edges, and uh, the constraint is that no edge uh, is allowed to send more bits than uh, what the, the capacity is. Okay, so any edge here in this network is allowed to send two bits 
uh, of information or send, send a message of two bits. Okay, so that's the setup. Now, in search a network, uh, what we're interested in is the coding rate. And the coding rate for a network, once we fix the sources and the sinks and the capacities, is the maximum R that we can handle, right? The largest length of the input messages that we can actually transmit through the network without violating any capacity constraints. Okay. So this problem of network coding, it's actually quite similar to a problem that uh, you might have seen before, which is called multi-commodity flow. So multi-commodity flow is very similar to uh, a max flow. Okay, so again here, in multi-commodity flow, you can consider a directed acyclic graph with capacities on the edges. You have sources, K sources, K sinks, and uh, each source has to transmit R units of flow to the corresponding sink. Right? So source one needs to transmit R units of flow to, uh, to sink one, sorry, and uh, the source S2 has to transmit R units of flow to sync T2. Right. And the flow has to flow through the network in a normal max flow. The only difference here is that we have different types of flow, right? We have a red flow, we have a blue flow, and we have a flow for each uh, for each pair of source sinks, like for each SI, TI. And the constraint is still that uh, no edge of this network is allowed to uh, forward more flow than its capacity. And here's the total flow, the sum of red and blue flow, or the sum of all types of flow, all K types of flow. Okay. So the flow rate in such a network is the maximum R that we can handle, the maximum number of units of flow that we can uh, concurrently transmit between uh, each source sync pair. Okay. So it looks very much like this network coding thing. So let's look at this example graph here. Like, so if you wanted to transmit uh, some flow from source S1 to sync T1, and you can see in this network, there's only one path from that source to that sink, right? And that's the path that's been highlighted in red here. It has to forward it to the middle, uh, the node in the middle top. Then it has to, that, that node transmits it down to the middle bottom, which transmits it over uh, to uh, the sink. So it has, the flow has to go along this edge because there are no other paths from S1 to T1. Okay, that's the only path. The same goes for uh, the flow that needs to be transmitted from S2 to T2. It has to go through this middle edge. Uh, you have to transmit it to the middle, send it down, and send it over to T2. Now, the flow rate right, is uh, the maximum R that we can concurrently transmit between each of the source sync pairs. Right. Since there only, uh, there's only one path for every pair, this is the only uh, choice you have for forwarding the flow. The red flow has to go to the middle down and, and over to the right, and the, the blue flow has to go to the middle down and over to the left. And as you can see, both flows has to use this edge in the middle that goes from the top middle to the bottom middle. So here, the maximum flow that can be, the maximum R that we can handle is one Right, because we need to transmit one unit of blue flow through this middle edge and one unit of red flow through this middle edge. And uh, we need to if we need to transmit R units of flow from every source sync pair, this is the best we can do. The flow rate is one uh, in this graph. Okay, so now back to network coding. All right, so this is just the same slide you saw earlier, right? We have the same setup. Uh, source one needs to transmit the message A1 to T1 and source two has to transmit the message A2 to T2. Okay, and the coding rate was the maximum number of bits that we can send uh, concurrently between each of these pairs. And this was the flow. We saw that you could transmit the flow like this. And actually, the flow kind of gives a protocol for sending bits in this communication network. Right, so uh, if we just say that, uh, if we just take this flow and uh, send messages, we just forward the messages along these flow paths, uh, then you can see that you get a protocol that doesn't violate the constraints. So, so for instance, again here, if we say uh, we have a flow rate of one, so I'm claiming we can also send one bit from each between each source sync pair simply by following this flow, right? So the flow gives a path for forwarding uh, one unit uh, of flow from S1 to T1 and one unit of flow from S2 to T2. 
Uh, and these paths never violate any of the uh, capacity constraints. So we could also just send one bit along these paths, right? So we just forward the bits along the paths, which means that if A1 is a one bit message and A2 is a one bit message, then this does, this is a valid protocol for transmitting bits uh, between the source sync pairs. Okay. So the claim here is that the coding rate, the, what, what you, the maximum number of bits you can concurrently transmit between these source sync pairs is at least what the integral uh, flow rate is. Okay, so integral means that I'm not allowed to split and send, say, send one 0 0.5 flow along one path and 0 0.5 flow along the other one. But let's ignore that for now and just assume that all the flows is integral. Okay, so then you can you could always do this. And you can see here, uh, there's an execution of the protocol. So let's say that uh, source one receives one bit a message which is a zero and source two receives a one bit message which is a one. They forward it along uh, these edges at the top. Here at the bottom right where we, we uh, in, when we go from the middle top node to the middle bottom node we concatenated the two messages so we just forward both of them. So we forward the message zero one. So it's a two bit message that is being sent along this path. The next node takes the first bit the zero and sends it out to uh, the destination uh, of the sync T1 and it sends the second bit to the sync T2. Okay, so you can use at least an integral flow uh, to get a protocol uh, for sending messages in this network. Okay, so the coding rate is at least the integral flow rate. You can of course ask yourself, can the coding rate be larger, right? Can I send messages in a more clever way uh, in order to get more uh, bits through the network? And it actually turns out that you can. Okay, so here's a different protocol uh, where I, if I have my input messages are bit vectors, so it's, uh, they might be they have r bits each. They might be longer than one. Then what I could do now is I can start at uh, the sync at the top. I forward the message a1 along both outgoing edges, both the one that goes down to t2 and the one that goes into the middle. The sync a2 also forwards its message to the middle and down. Now the node in the middle top, which receives both A1 and A2, can take these two bit strings and compute the bitwise XOR of these two, the exclusive OR. Right, so the exclusive OR of two R bit messages is also an R bit message. And then and the node forwards this R bit message down to the middle node. The middle node forwards these XORs out to the two uh, sinks. Now if we go down to the sink uh, T2, T2 received from the top node as one, it receives the message A1. And from the middle node in the bottom, it receives the message A1 XOR A2. Now, if you do a bitwise XOR of A1 and A1 XOR A2, uh, by the way the uh, bitwise XOR works, the two A1s cancel out and you're just left with A2. So you actually recover uh, the message A2 by XORing A1 and A1 XOR A2. The same goes for T1. Uh, which received A2 uh, from above and it received A1 XOR A2 from the middle. If you XOR these two numbers, you get just A1 and T1 has actually uh, recovered the message A1. Okay, so here you can ask yourself, you know, how long messages can I now handle? And as you can see now, the message along every single edge has length exactly R bits. And the capacity of every edge is two. So uh, you can actually handle messages of two bits in this network by using these XOR tricks. And here's just an example of an execution. If you say that uh, the message A1 is 0, 1, the message uh, A2 is 1, 1, both the sources forwards the messages along the edges, the top middle node computes the XOR of 0, 1 and 1, 1, that's 1, 0, sends it down, the middle node at the bottom sends the message 1, 0 out to the two sinks. A sync T2 computes the XOR of 0, 1 and 1, 0, which gives 1, 1, which is the message that was supposed to, to recover. And uh, the sync T1, which receives 1, 1 and 1, 0, uh, XORs these two to get the message 0, 1 and sends it on the output. So in this example, the coding rate is at least 2, right? So we managed to send 2 bits from S1 to T1 and two bits from S2 to T2 without violating any of uh, the edge constraints or the capacity constraints in the edges here. 
Okay, so indeed the coding rate can be larger than the flow rate. You can use bit tricks like XOR, for instance, uh, to get more data through the network. Okay, so this was the multi commodity flow. If we go back to multi commodity flow and look at the same graph, but let's try to undirect all the edges, right? So this time there are no directions on the edges, but it's the same structure of the network, right? So all the edges have capacity two. Uh, you have the sources, you have the sinks. Uh, what can we do in this undirected graph? So in an undirected graph, you can choose in which direction of the edge you want to transmit your flow. Uh, the total flow that flows across the edge, both in one direction and the other, has to be at most a capacity on the edge. So, oops. So in this example here, uh, if the if the graph is undirected, you can actually do better. Like remember, the flow rate was one in the directed setting, but in this undirected graph, you can do uh, something different. So if you look at it, the source is one, which receives i units of flow. So let's say it receives two units of flow. What it could do is it could send one unit of flow down to T2 and one unit of flow into the middle. The middle sends one the one unit of flow down and T2 sends the one unit of flow up to the bottom middle node. The bottom middle node can now forward both units of flows to T1. So this manages actually to, to send two units of flow from S1 to T1. If you look at S2, the source S2, it can send two units of flow into the middle node. The middle node can then send one unit of flow down, one unit of flow up to source 1, and source 1 sends the unit of flow down to T2, and uh, the unit of flow from the lower middle node is also sent out to T2. If you examine this picture, you can again see that no edge has more than two units of flow flowing across it. Okay, so the flow rate here uh, is at least two. And now we're finally ready to state the conjecture. Okay, so the conjecture by Lee and Lee, the undirected K-pass conjecture, says that if I have a directed acyclic graph, like over on the left, uh, as a communication network, then um, the coding rate in that network, so the number of bits that can be concurrently transmitted between every source sync pair, is no more than the flow rate in the corresponding undirected graph. Right, so take the same graph, make it undirected, and compute the flow rate, then uh, that flow rate is an upper bound on the coding rate in the directed graph. And so I just want to make you aware that if you go and read the original paper, it's stated a little different uh, in this conjecture, but it's this is just a rephrasing that's more convenient for our law, but it's basically uh, what they show. Okay. So uh, the intuitive interpretation of this conjecture is that bit tricks uh, like the exclusive OR and all, the, all of that, they cannot really help you for communicating bits in the network more than it would help to just undirect the edges and forward messages like a flow. Okay. You cannot gain more out of bit tricks than just sending flow uh, in the undirected and network. Okay, so And the flow in the undirected network could be translated back into just forwarding messages along the edges without doing any uh, tricks to it. So that's the intuitive interpretation of this conjecture, uh, saying that the coding rate of a directed acyclic graph is at most a flow rate in the corresponding undirected graph. Okay, the original conjecture just says that the, uh, the coding rate in an undirected graph is at most the flow rate in the same undirected graph. But uh, you can translate it into this. And this is the version that we're going to use. Okay, so now we are ready to state uh, our lower bound. Okay. So uh, our lower bound says that um, if the undirected k pairs conjecture is true, then any constant degree Boolean circuit, uh, so constant degree means that any gate has at most a constant number of outgoing edges and at most a constant number of incoming edges, any such circuit for multiplying two n-bit integers must have size at least n log n. Right, so here, this circuit that's visualized here, it has uh, two n inputs, all the n bits of a number x, all the n bits of a number y, and it has two n outputs, uh, set one to set two n, which are all the bits of the product of x one and uh, of x and y. Okay, so if you have such a circuit that computes this function, the multiplication of two n bit integers, then the size of the circuit has to be n log n. Okay, and here size of the circuit can be measured both in terms of the number of wires or edges or the number of gates and nodes. Uh, because they're the same when the degree of the circuit is constant. 
right? So then they're the same to within constant factors. Okay. So so that's the lower bound that we prove, and I'll show you the steps of the proof uh, in this lecture. Okay. And this lower bound matches the upper bound by Harvey and van der Hoeven, who gave an order n log n sized Boolean circuit for computing the product of two n bit integers. Okay. So it's a tight lower bound. Okay. So what we're going to use in this uh, proof is a small observation on binary multiplication. So uh, this observation is, this is a very simple one. If I have a number x uh, in binary and I multiply it by a power of 2, uh, y equals 2 to the j for some j, then that has the effect of shifting the bits of x by j positions. Right? So as you can see here, if I take 13 uh, it's a binary, as in binary, and I multiply it with the power of 2, here 2 to the 3, which is uh, 8. If I multiply these two numbers, then the product is basically the result of taking x and shifting it by j positions. Okay, so in this case, 3 positions. Okay, so this is an observation that we're going to use uh, in our proof. Okay, so the way we use it is that uh, what we're going to do to derive our lower bound is we'll basically still think of x as... Uh, an arbitrary number, but we're going to hard code y to some power of 2 in the circuit, right? So if I have a circuit for Boolean multiplication, I want to prove that it's uh, large. So what I do now is I say, I, well, I take the circuit and I'm going to hard code y to some power of 2 that I haven't decided on yet, but I'll, I'll do that. I'll hard code it to some 2 to the j. The observation is that if I do this, right, then the product here, the bits in the uh, in the product, will have the i plus jth output will equal the ith uh, bit of xi, right? Because the effect of multiplying with 2 to the j is shifting all the bits of x by j positions. So if I hard code y to be 2 to the j, then the i plus jth output set i sub j equals xi. And so really what we have here now, if I hard code y, is really a circuit uh, which can be thought of as a communication network for transmitting xi to set i plus j, right? Because you can think of really all of these gates as just transmitting messages. Uh, it gets some inputs, it computes the function of the inputs, and then it just forwards uh, the result on the outgoing edges, right? So let's just look at that. So let's say we have an AND gate in the circuit, and a gate receives in bits on the input edges, or the input wires, and then it computes the function, in this case the bitwise, uh, the end of the two bits, and then it sends these bits on the outgoing edges. Right. So that's what happens in the circuit. And basically this can just be thought of as a node in a communication network. It has two incoming edges. If it, it receives two, it, when it receives two bits, it just computes the end and forwards it on the outgoing edges. Right. So you can really think of this as a communication network, and all you need uh, in order to simulate the circuit of this communication network to correctly uh, forward all the messages or simulate the circuit is that all the capacities on the edges is one, right? Because this Boolean circuit would send just one bit along each edge. Okay, so you can, if you just put a capacity of one on all of the edges, you can actually uh, simulate the circuit in the communication network. Okay, so if this is our Boolean circuit, we can what we can do is we can from it we can obtain a communication network. Uh, where all capacities are one, and this communication network correctly computes the product, which means that if y is hard coded to two to the j, this effectively acts as a communication network for transmitting xi to set i plus j uh, for every i. Okay, so it is really a, a network coding solution with the sinks being uh, set 1 plus j, set 2 plus j, set 3 plus j, and the sources being x1, x2, x3, up to xn. Okay. So uh, the second observation that we're going to use is that the structure of the graph, the communication network, uh, is not going to change if we change y. Right? We can hard code y to different values, and it will be the same nodes and the same edges. Although the messages that are being sent may differ. Right. So when what I mean is that if we hard code one of these inputs, uh, one of the wires, whenever it forwards something along its edges, that communication node we've just hard coded what it is, so it already knows what bit will will enter here. Like it knows that I'm going to get a zero, or it knows I'm going to get a one already. Okay. 
So for every Y, the structure of the network is going to be the same, and that's going to be important later for the low route. Now, the idea is now, so now we have a communication network. And of course, we would like to use this under a K-pass conjecture to derive a lower bound. Okay, so we want to use it to lower bound the size of the graph. So uh, we have the sources x1 to xn. We have the sinks z1 plus j to zn plus j. And we know that we can send one bit, we can send the bit from xi to zi plus j just by simulating the circuit. Right, so we know that the coding rate is at least one because we can send the bit between each of these pairs by simulating the circuit. Okay, so we know that the coding rate is at least one. So now if we go back to what the conjecture said was, it said that if I have a directed acyclic graph as a communication network, then the coding rate in that uh, network is at most the flow rate in the corresponding undirected graph. Okay, so we have to look at the corresponding undirected graph. So let's take the circuit and undirect all the edges. We knew that the coding rate was at least one in the directed graph because the circuit actually forwards these bits. So what we know now is that the flow rate in this undirected graph also has to be at least one. And now what we want to do is we want to use this fact to lower bound the size of the graph. Right? We know that there has to be a lot of flow. Uh, we have to. We, it must be possible to send a lot of flow uh, from this source xi to the sink z i plus j concurrently for all uh, source sink pairs. So it must be possible to send one unit of flow from xi to z i plus j concurrently for every i. Okay. And the flow, of course, has to go through this undirected network uh, from X, starting at xi and ending up at zi plus j. The flow in this conjecture is allowed to be fractional, as we are allowed to split the flow and send it along several different paths, as long as it all ends up at zi plus j. Okay, that's not an issue for us. It, that works very well with the lower bound. Okay, we just know that this this way of forwarding flow must exist because the, it, it follows from the conjecture. Okay, and of course this flow, the way that you forward the flow, has to satisfy the capacity constraints of the network. So now, how can we argue that this graph has to be large? And for doing that, we need uh, one key observation. And that observation is that if the distance from xi to zi plus j, so from the i source to the i sink, is at least di, then the flow that is forwarded from xi to zi plus j must consume at least di units of capacity. Okay. So in this case here, the distance from xi to zi plus j is 3. We know that there has to be one unit of flow that has to go from xi to zi plus j. No matter which path it follows and no matter how we split it, any flow has to traverse along at least three edges. Which means that the total capacity that is kind of consumed by this flow is at least 3. Right? So here's an example of splitting the flow. You split the flow, send a half uh, out in each direction from xi. You forward a half upwards on the right path, on the left path, you split it into two again, and, and so on. And if you sum up all these capacities, uh, all these capacity that's being used by this flow, you get actually a three, right? You get uh, one unit of flow that's being spent by these edges at distance one from xi, you're getting one unit of flow by the edges uh, at distance two from xi, and you're getting one unit of flow at the edges of distance three to uh, from xi. Okay. So any edge in the network has capacity one. So therefore, the number of edges has to be at least the total capacity that's consumed, right? So the number of edges is at least the sum over all source sync pairs of the distance between them. Right? So now we have something, you know, this is a lower bound on the size of the network, right? It's a lower bound on the size of E, and it's lower bound in terms of the sum of the distances. So now all we need to do is to argue that, there's a, that for many source pink sync pairs, it's a long distance from the source to the sink. Okay. So basically what we want to argue is that this is not how the network looks like. Right? It's not the case that there's a short path from x1 to z1 plus j, there's a short path from x2 to z2 plus j, and so on. Right? We have to rule this out. Okay, so how can we do that? The key idea is that we can choose j. Right? That's what we said earlier on. Right? We can hard code j and to get uh, and, and the graph stays the same. Okay, so as we said, right, if we hard code y to 2 to the j, then uh, we get a, a network from sending from xi to zi plus j, and the structure of the graph does not change. Okay. So the question we ask now is, if I look at a, a, a source xi, how many 
uh, sinks or output bits uh, zk are within a distance d from xi. Okay. So here we're going to use that this is a bounded degree circuit. Right, so remember that any node of the circuit has at most uh, C output wires and C input wires for a constant C. Which means that the total degree of any node in this undirected uh, graph is at most 2 times C. So now the number of nodes within a distance of D from Xi is at most the sum from I equals 1 to D, so that's the distance, of 2C raised to the, oh sorry, raised to the I, not to the D. So that's a typo, so 2c raised to the i. Uh, so that's just because every time you go one step out, there's at most effect of 2c more nodes. And that's a, that's basically dominated by the last term. It's at most twice the last term. Uh, so 2 times 2c to the d. And uh, this is at most 2c to the d plus 1. So then you could ask yourself, well, how many things, if I now choose d to be 1 half log base 2c of n minus 1, you know, how many sinks are now within that distance? Well, if you plug that number in to the exponent d plus 1, you plug it in place of d, then uh, you get 2c raised to the 1 half log base 2c of n. That's square root n. Okay, so then you have at most square root n uh, sinks within a distance of 1 half log base 2c of n minus 1 from xi. Which also means that so this is, so for every choice of j, there's one particular sink that I need to transmit xi to. Well, there can only be square root n of these choices uh, that gives us a sink that is within distance one half log base two c of n from xi, which means that for all other choices of j, the distance from xi to set i plus j is at least one half log base two c of n. If c is a constant, this is omega log n. Which it means that for almost all choices of j, this is going to be a very long distance from xi to the corresponding sink. So just by averaging over all choices of j, there exists a choice j star such that the distance is at least one half log base 2c of n for at least n minus square root n different values of i. So almost all this, the sources have a long distance to the corresponding sink just by averaging. So what we do is we find such a j star and then we hard code y to equal this power of 2, 2 to the j star. So what does that mean now? Since we, if we hard code y to 2 to the j star, then almost all the sources have to, has a very large distance in this undirected network to the corresponding sink. Okay. All but a square root n of them has a long distance. Okay. Each edge has capacity 1. The number of edges in the uh, graph is at least the sum of these distances. Each a linear number of these terms is at least omega log n. So the total sum is omega n log n. Okay, so now that's the full proof. Uh, that gives us the lower bound on the size of this circuit. That's our theorem. If the undirected k-pairs conjecture is true, then any constant degree Boolean circuit for multiplying two n-bit integers must have size omega n log n. Okay. So the question that we asked in the beginning, is uh, multiplication harder than addition? The answer to that is, in fact, a yes, assuming this k-pairs conjecture, the undirected k-pairs conjecture from network coding. And it places multiplication exactly at n log n. What other implications does this uh, network coding conjecture have in complexity theory? Well, uh, back in this paper from 2006, Adlerdal gave low bounds for, the for circuits computing the matrix transpose. In this other work from 2019, we gave lower bounds for sorting integers. And the basic result here is if I want to sort huge volumes of integers, so large volumes of integers that they have to, some of it has to reside on a uh, low secondary storage like a disk, um, then the best you can do is uh, to run a comparison based sorting algorithm. Tricks like radix sort and stuff like this uh, doesn't help you. You have to just, you can might as well just do comparison based sorting. Uh, and this is in this so-called external memory model of uh, algorithms where you count the number of accesses to the disk that you have to make uh, to solve your algorithmic problem. So let me end by mentioning some uh, directions for future work. I think one good question is to look for other problems where it makes sense to prove lower bounds based on this network coding conjecture. Are there other central questions that might be addressed using this conjecture? I, of course, the really 
uh, nice result to prove, which would be like to prove this conjecture. Well, unfortunately, it's, it's probably going to be a hard uh, task because it will give the first superlinear circuit low bounds. Right? We just saw it will give n log n circuit low bounds. And that's beyond current scope of techniques in complexity theory. So, but it's a very nice uh, problem. And finally, I think the one thing that's also worth uh, attempting is to try and refute uh, this undirected KPS conjecture. Right? We don't know whether it's true. Uh, so you could, one could try to design a di directed acyclic graph where the coding rate actually exceeds uh, the flow rate in the corresponding undirected graph. I think that's also a goal that is worth at least spending some effort on doing, uh, which would have uh, quite some implications to network coding if you could actually do better. So thank you very much for listening to this talk, and I hope you enjoyed the topic and that you're interested in learning more about uh, lower bounds, and lower bounds in particular based on uh, this network coding architecture.